Last September, after two years of online events and team gatherings due to COVID restrictions, we were able to host the first in-person Security in Context conference. The Landscapes of Insecurity inaugural conference, organized in collaboration with the Center for Peace and Development at the University of Oklahoma, brought together Security in Context's international network of scholars to share their work and brainstorm new ways of addressing and combating global insecurity. At this conference, we had the chance to talk to some of the key people leading Security in Context research tracks, who shed some light into the research that has been produced within the project since its inception and gave us a taste of Security in Context's future research initiatives. In addition to these tracks, the project both supports and benefits from the rich research and cross-regional expertise of its network partners, whose leaders we also had the pleasure to talk to in between sessions at the Landscapes of Insecurity inaugural conference. Welcome to the Security in Context podcast. I'm your host, Anita Fuentes, and this episode will offer an in-depth perspective of who we are and what we do at Security in Context. Our guests in this episode include Omar Dahi, Project Director of Security in Context and Economics Professor at Hampshire College. Great to speak with you, Anita. Shana Marshall, Associate Director of the Institute of Middle East Studies and Assistant Research Faculty Member at the George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs. Thanks for um, asking me to talk about it. Pete Moore. Associate Professor of Politics at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, thank you. Lisa Hajar, Professor of Sociology at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Thank you for having me. Fred Demir, Co-Director of Security and Context and Professor of Economics at the University of Oklahoma. Thank you for having me. Rabia Nasser economist, researcher, and co-founder of the Syrian Center for Policy Research. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And Fernando Brangoli, assistant professor of international security and geopolitics at the Institute of International Relations and Defense at the University of Rio de Janeiro. Thank you. Security in Context has three main components, knowledge production, pedagogy, and public policy. All three components are deeply intertwined and they are developed in collaboration with Security in Context's wide research network, which includes organizations and scholars from around the world who work on similar themes. We asked Omar Dahi, Project Director of Security in Context, to walk us through the project and to tell us how that first component, that is knowledge production, which is achieved through the original collaborative research conducted by members and partners of the initiative, drives and informs the other two pillars of the project. If you look at the work that we're doing, we really consider the key driver of this project is original collaborative research that we conduct uh, by the core members of the initiative, which includes myself and, and some of the key people that you just mentioned in your introduction, uh, but also collaborative research that we take on with uh, partners in the U.S. and also in the Global South. And the idea is to sort of work together on uh, what we consider are some of the most urgent and pressing questions that have to do with securitization, militarism, peace and conflict, gender and security, uh, and so on. And the reason for that is is very simple, is because this project emerged out of a critique of the practices of endless militarism, securitization, the uh, increased surveillance of populations and control of populations around the world, the way that wars, sanctions, interventions are transforming societies and, and really um, having significant negative impact on human development, on social justice really tying together, as, as we often talk about, the, the key issues of sort of militarism, securitization with the global inequalities and with environmental change. Uh, and so our impetus for this emerge out of a critique of those practices and those practices and those policies are also supported by immense knowledge production from states and from other actors who are really invested and benefit and advance this uh, highly destructive agenda. 
Uh, many people know that. Many people know that uh, knowledge production matters. Uh, you know, we, that's why we see uh, the U.S. government, governments around the world uh, constantly producing their perspectives, investing in knowledge production, supporting think tanks and uh, basically um, uh, media outlets and, and so on that, that support their point of view. And we've often critiqued those perspectives. But what we want to do is go beyond the critique rather than just critiquing knowledge production that we don't like, create alternative knowledge production, create alternative ways and imaginaries of thinking through the world and thinking about the world. And we want to do so with research. We want to do so with evidence. We want to do so with grounded uh, empirical analysis that analyzes the world and really tries to conceptualize alternatives. So it's not just one opinion against another opinion. It's basically opinion that is backed up by evidence, but that is also backed up by perspectives of uh, institutions, people, societies that have been most impacted by the kind of processes that I mentioned. So research has always been and will always be our key driver, original research that is produced by the project that is collaborative. Uh, and then that research will in turn inform the other aspects of our output, which are our pedagogical outputs and also the public policy. The, the research will be the raw material that really informs how we produce teaching materials and, and alternative resources for instructors who want to uh, basically teach uh, security from a critical perspective or maybe activists and journalists who are looking for um, different perspectives on how do we understand, for example, the, with the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, rather than the one that's dominant in the media, so to speak. Uh, and then finally, we have our public policy, which is basically inviting people who are like-minded and even people who are not like-minded to engage in dialogue and understanding around the research material that we produce to both get different perspectives about it, to validate it, and also to really make an impact on the public debate around these issues. When asked to describe what makes security in context research different to that of other projects, both Omar Dahi and Farad Damir brought up interdisciplinarity as one of the defining aspects of the project. From the very beginning, I think our values are that um, lots of people have something to say about security. We tend to think about security, uh, at least in uh, everyday media, in the West, in the newspapers, on TV, you tend to find a very specific subset of people who come from, um, you know, strategic studies or uh, international relations, uh, or really who work for the government, who are supposed to be the experts on security. And and our thinking is that no, actually, security impacts the everyday life of everyone on the planet, uh, and uh, lots of people have something valuable uh, to say about this topic. So, uh, anthropologists, sociologists people who are working with women in um, uh, Syria, uh, people who are looking at um, the impact of, of imprisonment and carceral politics on uh, racialized populations. All of those people are uh, investigators into security and their knowledge production is as valid as that sort of traditional set of uh, mostly men from, you know, these uh, very narrow disciplines that talk about, you know, strategic studies and national security and state actions. So interdisciplinarity is more than just uh, a way of, uh, you know, advancing research that is more, um, that is broader than, than those narrow ways. It's really a value of the project and it's really a political value or a political principle that actually, um, much wider populations have something uh, legitimate to say. So when, you know, look at some of the interviews we've been doing, we've been, uh, you know, doing interviews with activists in Brazil who work with racialized populations in Brazil and look at how the Bolsonaro regime has really securitized their daily life and in what ways they have mobilized to overcome this um, language of hate and language of sort of white supremacy and also the practices of policing and sort of the militarization of the police. Uh, that's, that's actually a security question, right? And you can't get at that question. You can't understand it by really focusing simply on, you know, what is called high politics or state uh, security uh, 
uh, talk and, and language. Um, and so uh, if you look at the researchers involved with the project, you see people from those disciplines, political science and international relations, but those who do so from very critical perspectives, but you also see sociologists, you also see anthropologists, you also see feminist uh, researchers, uh, and you also see people who work on political economy from a very uh, wide perspective that includes race, gender, and, and class issues as well. I think the research, academic research particularly, has changed significantly in the last 30 years. I think the, the movement from Newtonian physics to quantum physics, where instead of relying on just one dimension, we have come to accept the multidimensionality of questions and problems. And um, like in medical science, right, for doctors in medical schools, they teach first don't do harm before doing help, uh, has become more acceptable in academics. And that's where we have this interdisciplinarity and cross um, disciplinary work have come to. Because when you have one intervention or one um, analysis or one, uh, you know, depending on your gaze or one's gaze, your analysis changes. So we need to look at the same object, the same question, uh, same uh, research issue from multiple dimensions at the same time. Um, oil, for example, could be a, a good source of development, but also could be a curse for that country. And also who benefits, how they benefit, what are the short-term and long-term benefits of that is a good example. You may come up with a new technology like fracking that allows you to extract natural fossil fuels, for example, very efficiently. It might fulfill the needs of the community for a while, but at the same time it might be polluting your underground water resources for the next thousands of years, or it might cause fault lines and earthquakes uh, and cause significant damage to those communities. Or you may extract the oil and then abandon the well, and un untapped or closed oil wells may continue to exert damage to farmers and ranchers and other communities living in that neighborhood. So we need to look at multiple dimensions and um, costs and benefits. And plus, I don't think any particular discipline has a monopoly over understanding a particular question. Uh, that means, you know, I think this researcher needs to be humble in admitting that I only see one dimension and there are multiple dimensions that can be explored, analyzed, um, and understood from others. When Security in Context was born, a number of research tracks were launched, which included financialization and militarism, war economies, legacies of the global war and terror, and multipolarity in New South-South relations, among others. These tracks became the core drivers of the project's outputs and have made significant progress in the past two years since the project's inception. During the conference, my colleague Amnia Halil and I interviewed the leaders of some of Security in Context research tracks, including Shana Marshall, Pete Moore, Lisa Hajar, and Omar Dahi. Shana Marshall discussed the financialization and militarism research track, which explores the intersection of big finance and the military-industrial complex. The research track that I'm leading is on um, financialization and its links with militarization. Um, primarily sort of the dramatic increase in what you might call surplus capital or surplus accumulation that exists in the global economy, which is largely, of course, a byproduct of growing inequality. Um, and all of that money sloshing around in the global system is looking for an outlet um, where it can make sizable returns. And one of those outlets, one of the main outlets, really has been um, militarized production or uh, weapons development, new weapons technologies, etc. So I was really interested in this surplus liquidity that was sloshing around the global economic system and how it was getting funneled into military industrial production and into financing the development of new weapons technologies and also in creating new centers um, especially in the Gulf states in the Middle East, but also in places like South Africa and South Korea and India, um, into developing new, or not necessarily new, but expanding existing indigenous defense production um, and really um, getting a lot of these uh, countries into the sort of second tier of weapons developing nations, which is a significant change 
um, in the global sort of the global arms trade and the and the global um, military industrial sort of complex. Um, I also, of course, you know, was very interested in the global financial crisis in 2007, 2008, um, when sort of the entire world was reading about <laughs> a lot of these um, new financial technological innovations and innovations in the financial sector. Um, and so I was reading a lot about venture capital and private equity um, and the money that they were directing toward um, securitized technologies or military technologies, right? So surveillance, biometrics, um, a lot of new border technologies and things like this that were being really, um, uh, were being sort of um, enabled through the increasing allocations of this surplus capital um, that had much fewer sort of strings or requirements or rules um, behind its investment than more traditional sort of forms of investment like institutional investors or pension funds or state governments even that are that are looking to invest in their military production sector. So it was sort of like a, a you know, sort of seemed like a, almost like an unregulated Wild West sort of um, condition that was driving so much of this capital into the military industrial sector and was producing these really sort of terrifying new technologies at a very rapid pace. One of the sort of key um, goals of the group was to bring together on the one hand um, people who had experience with uh, critical security studies um, international relations theorists, um, you know, area studies scholars who worked on the Middle East and other uh, world regions that were heavily securitized or impacted by uh, imperialism on the one hand, and then people who had some knowledge and experience of economics and economic theory on the other hand, because usually you don't get someone that has both of those ex areas of expertise because they're very divergent and it's very difficult to develop a lot of expertise in both of those areas simultaneously. So the idea was to have people from each sort of area um, come and work together on thinking through this issue of global financialization um, and how it was impacting the development of military technologies and general sort of militarization of global uh, manufacturing and production. Um, and so we did have, you know, a mix of economists and area studies scholars and I think did very well in um, actually um, directing some of the effort toward producing works that uh, essentially were demonstrating the phenomenon, right? Not necessarily trying to take the theorizing to a new level, but actually trying to... Um, collate and generate the empirics that we need um, to develop case studies and databases that would actually demonstrate the linkages, the concrete linkages between financialization and militarization. All right, so Heidi's case study is a good example um, because we know that, you know, it's logical to us that defense firms are very profitable because we see that in the news. Um, but we don't necessarily know why they are more profitable than other companies, right? So it's important to just uh, use the data that we can access to, to sort of establish that it is, in fact, monopoly conditions that are generated by these contracting rules that all actually bring us to the point where defense firms actually are more profitable um, than other similarly situated manufacturing firms. So it's important to sort of establish some of these relationships um, using the existing data so that we can then sort of fold that into um, further theorizing. Uh, so we had similar um, contributions from Heidi um, as well as uh, Ismet uh, from Turkey who, who demonstrates sort of a, ser a significant um, relationship um, between Turkish investment and the growth of the military industrial sector in that country also. I think, um, you know, there's so many excellent people working in the Security and Context Project um, looking at uh, security from race 
and racial and ethnic perspectives and gendered perspectives um, and regionalism, right, the, the influence of different, different regions on our understanding of security and how, um, you know, U.S. imperialism and other forms of imperialism are impacting those regions also. Um, and I was really interested in bringing sort of a, I guess, a, a ruling class <laughs> perspective to that, specifically by looking at um, the financial sector and the global financial industry. Because, um, you know, when we think about the impact of these technologies on um, populations in the global south or what some call the majoritarian world, right, or um, the periphery, um, all of these... Uh, all of these perspectives really need to be brought together to give us, um, I think, a comprehensive understanding of um, the nuances of securitization um, and all of the places where those, um, I guess, those um, dominant ideologies are generated and then enacted upon these um, populations. Pete Moore talked to us about the War Economies track, which looks at how war preparation and war making change institutional structures and society. So uh, the track that I'm involved in is called the War Economies track, and it brings together about six or seven um, contributors and their research. Um, much of the work is on uh, the Middle East, but not exclusively. Some of the work is on um, Latin America, uh, North Africa. And uh, the focus of our work is sort of twofold. One, we're working to sort of reconceptualize, uh, redefine the concept of war economies uh, in the early 21st century. It's a concept that originated in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and has undergone a number of uh, changes, particularly in the post-Cold War period, and more specifically in the last 20 years of the war on terrorism, uh, the concept of war economies has come to describe uh, complex uh, political economies that are constitutive, constitutive of um, or expressive of uh, political economy dynamics. Um, and the second main thrust is to develop the empirical research that we're working on uh, to be part of a, a, a comprehensive um, uh, presentation and analysis of war economies under different contexts, uh, time periods. Um, so one of the main areas is to, uh, which I mentioned, is, to, is this conceptualization around war economies because we don't want it to be too broad and it's sort of meaningless, but nevertheless... Uh, we want it, you know, in our discussions, we want the, con the conceptualization to be broad enough to, to fit, you know, the diverse uh, directions of our own research. Um, and this is where the tension comes in, but also to have, um, have the research disseminated in a way um, that joins other policy discussions, right? Because the concept of war economies uh, is... Um, analyzed at the international level under different sort of titles. Could be um, uh, conflict economies or the difficulties of post-war reconstruction. Um, so, that, so one of our conversations has been both to conceptualize war economies so that this research is speaking to similar questions, um, but also have it amenable to uh, intervening in these other policy discussions in which we feel that uh, maybe not as comprehensive, um, you know, or sees conflict as neatly divided between here's the fighting and then here's the period after, whereas the concept of war economies that we're, we're um, dealing with, you know, stretches through periods of high and low violence. Um, in our research conversations and presentations, um, we're also thinking about levels because some of the work is very much at the transnational level. Uh, for example, uh, my colleague Sean Yeom and I are working on uh, U.S.-Jordanian uh, security relationships and militarization uh, relationships and how that has impacted uh, the Jordanian uh, social economy and socioeconomic development. 
Um, others are working at sub-state levels um, to look at local communities uh, um, that have experienced violence, uh, state-sanctioned violence around mining in North Africa. Um, so a lot of the conversations have been trying to make sense of our research, but research that's working at different levels. You know? So I think that's, that's challenging. Um, and then I think also a third area that our conversations and the research uh, has exposed is exactly trying to pinpoint where we are um, in terms of this global war on terrorism the last 20, 30 years, particularly in the Middle East. Are we at a point where we're transitioning? Uh, are we at a point where the consequences of these decades of, of violence, now we're really beginning to see the kinds of effects beyond just uh, deaths and sort of societal brutalization that occurs. And now we're beginning to see the longer term effects, whether it's in terms of refugees, uh, whether it's in terms of national militaries and security organizations. Um, so, you know, and, and I, I have to say, you know, at this point we've really only had one face-to-face -face meeting among the researchers. I think that, you know, the COVID thing uh, for a lot of research, you know, had these negative effects. So uh, we're, we're very excited about the next stages, I think, where we get to, we can work more intensely with one another on these papers and the research projects. Lisa Hajar talk to us about the research track devoted to studying the legacies of the global war on terror, which explores the impact that the war on terror has had on populations, particularly in the global South and the United States. Well, I started, um, I teamed up with a colleague at UCSB, um, Terrence Wooten, before we joined Security in Context. And we wanted to look at, um, you know, sort of the, the war on terror in global context. And then when Security in Context invited me to, to partner up with them, I think that's what we've been doing. And it's been so far uh, quite productive in terms of uh, we had a conference in May 2021. It was a virtual conference, but we had uh, you know, people from 13 different countries, and we presented our talk really thinking about uh, carceralism in a comparative perspective in the Middle East, Latin America, and North America. Um, and so now, you know, I've been teaching students work, who are working with the project. Last year, we focused very much on thinking about Israel and Palestine as a kind of laboratory for technologies and rhetorics um, of global carceralism. And this year, we're actually um, expanding our focus to looking at legacies of past and present wars on terror in Latin America. Well, it, in a sense, we've looked at, um, I mean, my group has been particularly focusing on the U.S. war on terror, but also thinking very comparatively because nothing can really be thought about in a, in a vacuum. So we've looked at um, prison resistance, tort comparative torture practices, um, the ways in which uh, communities of, you know, those who are affected by carceralism and and uh, sort of global war respond um, with solidarity or resistance themselves. So we're really, um, in a sense, looking at both how states manifest and perpetrate uh, carceralism in all its various forms, making certain people or certain classes of people unfree, how people who are subjected directly to carceralism uh, endure or resist that in the, that context, and then solidarity um, you know, and, and thinking comparatively as a way of, you know, the best way to deal with carceralism, first step is to really understand how it works. We also took the chance to ask her about her latest book, The War in Court, a 20 year long ethnography that shows how hundreds of lawyers mobilized to challenge the illegal treatment of prisoners captured in the war on terror and helped force an end to the U.S. government's most odious policies. Well, I mean, I've been working on this book really since the beginning of the war on terror. I mean, I wouldn't say I was working on the book. I started uh, like really from the almost immediately after the September 11th, 2001 attacks. It became very clear to me that the United States was going to 
adopt torture because of things that, that officials were saying and the way in which uh, it was being stated very early on that people who would be captured in the war would be held incommunicado and the need, the desperate need for information. Um, so I was obviously like looking for torture, Amer evidence of American torture before it became public. But what really um, moved me and the, and the focus of the book was the efforts by lawyers, slowly at first, and then building up um, over time to resist and challenge various aspects of the US government's prisoner policies. And this began really only five or six months after 9-11 when a very small group of lawyers, Michael Ratner and two death penalty lawyers, um, filed the first lawsuit in US federal court challenging President Bush, George W. Bush's authority to secretly detain people at Guantanamo. And so, you know, I started doing research on these kind of legal challenges and one leads to another to another. And so my book, The War in Court Inside the Long Fight Against Torture, is really a 20 year history of efforts to challenge the government's prisoner policies. And most of those challenges were um, undertaken by lawyers and their allies, human rights activists, supported by investigative journalists. But, you know, my book is written, it's, you know, I call it the war in court, and it is almost like a military history. You know, you focus on one battle, who are the, who are the actors, what are the, what are the stakes in a battle, what's the outcome of that battle, and how that changes the terrain for the next battle to come. And so the book, you know, sort of thinking about um, not only the challenges of secret detention at Guantanamo, which was actually won by the challengers in 2004, which enabled um, hundreds, hundreds of American lawyers then volunteer to represent Guantanamo detainees as habeas counsel. So that's one big track was the efforts to challenge the detention of you know, the 780 people who were at Guantanamo. But another track of challenge was actually um, military defense lawyers who were assigned to represent some of the detainees, a very small number, whom the government decided to prosecute in these new military commissions that were set up at Guantanamo. And so that's a big part of the book is looking at the not very many cases, but the legal implications of those cases and efforts to challenge the legality of that legal of that uh, court system. Another dimension of my book looks at efforts by both American and European lawyers, in particular, to pursue accountability cases against U.S. civilian and military officials who were responsible for torture at Abu Ghraib in Guantanamo, etc. So there were efforts; they didn't actually succeed to prosecute certain U.S. individuals in the courts of Germany. Um, etc. But so that's another like sort of the accountability aspect. And finally, you know, I started going to Guantanamo as a journalist in 2010. And between 2010 and 2020, I made 14 trips to Guantanamo, many of them since 2013, to observe and report on the case um, against five people accused of playing roles in the 9-11 terrorist attacks. So it's the, that the 9-11 case has been, and that you know, comprises the final chapter of my book because all five defendants were disappeared by the CIA and brutally tortured in black sites for several years until a court case in the Supreme Court you know, that, that the challengers won, forced the Bush administration to empty the CIA black sites in September 2006 and move 14 um, former CIA detainees to Guantanamo, including the five who are on trial in 9-11. So I've been really look, you know, going to Guantanamo, staying for weeks at a time, year after year, enabled me to really see this fight against torture in very specific ways as it played out in the 9-11 case. So I would say just overall, my book is, you know, kind of, as I describe it, it's the anti-torture history of the war on terror. And it really tracks across 20 years of ongoing fights. And the fight against torture is not over. Omar Dahi talked about the multipolarity and new South-South relations research track which examines the nexus of economic, financial, political, security infrastructures and linkages alongside the human development implications of the rise of new global powers, and on the other hand, the changing relations among global South countries. 
Yeah, this research theme uh, has different threads that came together to basically make it, as you mentioned, one of the central uh, themes of the project. Uh, I have a long-standing interest in South-South relations, in economic, security, financial links between developing countries. Uh, Farad Demir and I have published many articles and, and a book on this topic, and we've been looking at it for the last 10, 15 years. Uh, so we have a significant investment on it, and it be, really started off from being something that had a fringe interest in it. If you look at 15, 20 years ago, there may be some people looking at the rise of China and, and basically economic ties between developing countries, but they were considered very marginal. And now they become a key factor in international relations, a key factor in the global economy that you really can't ignore. And when we started security in context for the reasons that I discussed to really produce alternative knowledge production, it seemed like a real uh, perfect fit to combine those uh, elements together and think about um, features and, and uh, processes in global economy, global politics, global securitization uh, that really imagine alternatives, that really think about what are the alternative uh, arrangements that are happening around the world. And also to ask whether these alternative arrangements provide uh, better approaches to, um, to politics, to economics, to finances, and so on. So South-South trade has always been conceptualized uh, as a as a positive alternative to north south trade, which is uh, really uneven and creates uh, inequalities between basically the rich and the poor countries. Uh, now, what we are actually seeing is that uh, the reality is much more complicated than that. So we're looking at China and Africa and China and Latin America, and we see significant alternatives. Uh, for example, politically, they're increasingly aligned. Uh, in ways that are resisting Western uh, intervention and imposing of Western conditionality on them. Uh, for example, when China joined the World Trade Organization, they joined many of the blocks of the global South that have been pushing back against US, Canada, Japan, and Europe, which is known as the Quad. Uh, there are, of course, negative aspects to this as well, as, as we increasingly see. For example, China's impact on South America has been deindustrializing. Uh, Latin American countries had significant experience in manufacturing industry, for example, and they are really outcompeted by China. So uh, we believe that we can't understand global dynamics today without looking at the complexity of the world, without investigating alternative arrangements, and uh, we have this uh, research track as, as really a central part of, of, of the project, and it's going to really continue in the next phase to look at the question of multipolarity. What does it mean that we have rising powers? What does it mean that we have challenges to Western dominance? Is that multipolarity, um, what does it mean for uh, very poor countries that are not rising powers? What does it mean for many South Asian and Sub-Saharan uh, countries that are left behind potentially when you see the rise of China and uh, India and, and uh, other sort of large developing countries? Um, we're also finding some ways in which this multipolarity is, is exaggerated. So one of the things that we're uh, going to be bringing online very soon is a unique database that Professor Kevin Young at the University of Massachusetts Amherst has been working on, which is looking at the leadership of international organizations. It's looking at really who governs multinational institutions, whether they're transnational civil society or uh, multinational institutes such as United Nations commissions and so on. And we're finding that multipolarity there is actually exaggerated. We, we have uh, still, at least in that aspect of global politics, the dominance of the US and its allies in terms of the fact that the overwhelming amount of uh, people sort of governing those organizations are from the US. So this is really why we think that multipolarity is a key aspect of our work. Uh, in the next phase, we're gonna be producing a lot of policy papers and policy briefs uh, that really think about um, uh, impact of uh, economic warfare, for example, sanctions, Western sanctions in particular, what are their uh, intended and unintended consequences? So one of the things we see as a result of the war in Ukraine is significant food insecurity in other parts of the global south. So those are some of the kind of research uh, approaches that we're going to be doing under this theme. And uh, we also have 
uh, a number of papers that have been uh, prepared, like longer research papers prepared by our uh, researchers that we're going to be publishing uh, online very soon. In addition to the research tracks, Security in Context connects organizations and centers from around the globe interested in critical research on security-related issues through the Security in Context Research Network, a network aimed at encouraging collaborative research and scholarly exchange. The Security in Context project is housed at the Institute for Social Science Research at the University of Massachusetts Amherst with strategic partnerships at the Arab Studies Institute in Washington, D.C., the Orphelia Center for Global and International Studies at UC Santa Barbara, the Center for Peace and Development at the University of Oklahoma Norman, the Syrian Center for Policy Research in Vienna, Austria, the Arab Council for the Social Sciences in Beirut, Lebanon, and the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Global South, Northwestern University in Doha, Qatar. Together, the network critically examines the challenges of peace and conflict from multiple perspectives and geographic locations. It produces the data and research to advance inclusive and social justice-oriented conceptions of security. At the Landscapes of Insecurity inaugural conference, we were able to talk to Fra Demir, who told us about the Center for Peace and Development's partnership with Security in Context and the different collaborative research initiatives that have been developed through this partnership in the past two years. Center for Peace and Development at the University of Oklahoma, and I'm co-director together with Dr. Uh, Deacon, um, is, is one of the major development centers at the university. It's targeting sustainable peace and durable, durable and sustainable peace and development. So how do, what do we understand from development uh, along multifaceted dimensions and also peace and how we can make it durable? How can we make it bottom up? So it's a transformative approach to grassroots based bottom up peace development uh, that is both sustainable and development and achievable and desirable. So the Center for Peace and Development was established in 2017 with that vision in mind. It's a multi-cross and interdisciplinary center that we have six different colleges um, working with the center. And we have colleagues and affiliates well, from uh, dozens of different units and departments. The uh, our reaching goal or the underlying theme for all of our collaboration, I think, is to is to a change our understandings of development which usually in academics is interpreted as top-down structural change and turned it into what we understand from development bottom-up um, that is sustainable and for peace uh, building the cpd and sic goals um, overlap to a significant degree including critical approach to security and insecurity studies to development and, and peace building that uh, is based on research, that is not extractive, that is not exploitative, and it's based on bottom-up, looking at uh, the question of insecurity um, through multiple angles and identify different actors and agents and, uh, and accepting agency while doing it also. And how can we change the landscape of top-down um, and military or law and order-based definition of security but also looking at who's security, who's insecurity, at what cost. Um, and CPD's goals and, and research topics have been overlapping with security in context. And we are partnering along multiple dimensions. Uh, the last two years of collaboration um, focused on several teams uh, or clusters of research. And one of them is multipolarity and global power competition um, that is um, replacing the Cold War competition between the, the Western-dominated worldview with the Soviet-dominated worldview. So the multipolarity, the niche south side relations, and the landscapes of insecure that came out of that, those interactions, both for actors within the Global South, because Global South is not a homogenous uh, block either. Uh, the interests of some powers, be that China or India or Turkey, uh, might come at the expense of other Southern actors and uh, and organizations. So that is one cluster and, and we have been working and partnering and researching. A uh, second one is on financialization and war economies. It also has taken a significant amount of research and, and, and investment in terms of time. And we have several uh, uh, 
affiliates and, and researchers working on it uh, from you know, across different universities and, and, and uh, research institutes. A uh, third one is the peace building, the grassroots based uh, gender and peace building intersection of or intersectionality of those uh, dimensions. So, what do we understand from durable and sustainable peace building? Which actors uh, are involved or should be targeted? CPD is based on women's grassroots organizations in terms of peace building that are seen as the key actors in many post conflict societies or situations. The NGOs or intergovernmental actors or governmental actors focus on ex-combatants and military or government forces, and mostly women and children are left behind even though they suffer the most. And even long after the cessation of the hostilities, they su continue to suffer um, in terms of both development but other insecure aspects of underdevelopment and, and peace building. So our focus is on that, and I think there's a significant overlap regarding um, different hubs of SIC that, that we can uh, work with. A third one is, um, that, uh, a fourth one is that, that we'd like to partner and continue to work with is measuring insecurity. So what do we understand from insecurity? Are there ways of measuring insecurity um, that are different than the standard metrics? Um, be that income, uh, poverty, one dollar a day levels, uh, education, longevity, healthcare. Um, there are already a variety of metrics that can be used, but there are also other, other metrics that needs to be developed yet that are not developed, that are not identified, um, and we will continue to work on those dimensions um, going forward. We were also able to catch Rabia Nasser in between sessions, the director of one of Security in Context's key research partners the Syrian Center for Policy Research. And this is precisely what we talked about during the interview, the collaboration and synergies between the Syrian Center for Policy Research and Security in Context. Uh, I'm working with the Syrian Center for Policy Research uh, since we established the organization in 2011. It is an independent, non-for-profit organization. Uh, we started the work in, I mean, uh, difficult conditions uh, while there is starting of the social movement in Syria in 2011 with a huge hope of, uh, sub, uh, I mean, achieving a substantial uh, change. So we aimed in the center for research, dialogue and influence, trying to engage with society, with producing the evidence and in, in an interactive way, and then to use this as part of the influencing the uh, future, opening more options, uh, for, I mean, different kind of uh, policies related to inclusive development in general. Actually, it's it's uh, it's uh, there is uh, uh, a lot of shared themes and methodologies with the security in context. First, when we when we are trying to to handle the concept of the political economy of war or conflict. So this is a substantial part of understanding insecurity in the region. The behavior of political actors toward the society in, in the authoritarian uh, regimes, or after that, using a direct conflict with, against the people, society, and non-state actors, this is a substantial part of understanding uh, uh, the insecurity. And also, the, the region with this substantial shift toward invest, investment in, in weapons and the transform the wealth of, of oil and other remittances toward uh, conflict and toward uh, uh, policies that have been used by the oppressors. This is also uh, overlapped with, uh, with the security in context. But the most important thing that uh, we are working in the transformative uh, participatory approach, which is in line with uh, our understanding that we are not coming to teach to uh, the society or to make awareness for the society. We are trying to, as part of these communities around the world, to work together toward this transformation, to think together. The tools of research is very useful if it's independent and inclusive and working within the ethical code of research, this will be very helpful tool for these communities to, to build, to use these tools for, for the change. I think this, all of these 
is a common interest uh, with uh, the security context in, one, in this regard and also uh, what we establish as uh, a podcast to discuss the the alternatives uh, for Syria is one uh, one step to for the, uh, to fulfill this. Uh, we conducted many research uh, in terms of uh, field work uh, within challenging the conceptual epistemologic uh, uh, methodological uh, uh, themes and issues, and then trying to innovate some methods to work within the conflict context. Uh, recently, we concentrate, for instance, on the the question of citizenship, how we can see citizenship with a fragmented state, how we can look for this and this kind of transnational solidarity that you can see sometimes, and also the identity politics and the huge polarization within the society. So these difficult situation, we try to reinvest in understanding how this citizenship could be in the future how we can look for a different um, relation between society and, quote-unquote, the state in the future. Um, we concentrate also on the solidarity, the social solidarity issue and solidarity economy. So we're trying to see how the society rebuild the relations uh, and avoid the reproducing the uh, inequalities within the mainstream uh, economic policies and rebuilding the trust and shared values that keep the relations uh, healthy between people. At least this is as, uh, as a, a looking for a vision in the future and to see what, what, what does it take now to transform from the foundations of conflict toward this uh, future. And in this regard also, uh, we try to see how to dismantle the conflict economies to transform towards solidarity economy, what, what we think is one of the alternative for a better future. Finally, we talked to Fernando Brancoli, a member of Security and Context Advisory Board and a key research partner, who told us about how his own research ties into the project. Fernando's research revolves around the ways in which narratives of violence and neoliberalism circulate in the global south, especially in the Middle East and Latin America, where he's from. I'm a professor now at the uh, University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and we are trying to understand for a group of colleagues how uh, narratives regarding security, insecurity, and threat has been circulating in global south countries. So we are not only trying to mapping how, for example, narratives regarding terrorism, criminals, are, for example, being dealt together by Brazilian and Egyptian uh, governments, for example, but also how local actors, uh, not only related to the state, are actually engaging in this conversation. Uh, and lately, right, what we're doing right now is also trying to map how resistant movements, also in Brazil and other global South countries, are actually engaging on this and resisting to this, not only creating their, their own concepts regarding how, for example, uh, threats of terrorism should not be included in Brazil right now, but also trying to engage in alliances, for example, with resistance movements in other places that are dealing with this. So there's not only a constellation of uh, the global South countries, some, sometimes quite authoritarians, trying to uh, say that there is like a, a coincidence of threats between those countries, but also now resistant groups saying, listen, we don't want to deal with this, and together we can engage in different uh, perspectives. I was quite interested in um, uh, our colleagues back in Brazil at the same time on how uh, the security in context were really interested to create new methodological tools to deal or to deal with the, uh, the threats and risks that uh, global South countries are uh, dealing right now. So uh, for me, it was just amazing to actually interact and be able to read what other scholars were dealing. And at the same time, there was support for doing this kind of thing. So for us, uh, back in Brazil, for example, we were quite interested in how indigenous community in the Amazon rainforest uh, were dealing, for example, with extractivism between Israel and China. And I mean, Brazil is a quite big country, it can be quite expensive, it can be quite bad. It's uh, difficult to get there and be able to get the support and the discussion with colleagues for this. Uh, the program was also, for me, uh, it was a life saving moment to actually be able to do this. So. I think there was, by one hand, this sort of theoretical and epistemological perspective uh, coming from uh, colleagues from the project, which 
somehow, I think, explode our point of views on how to deal with this kind of things. And the other hand, more practical things related how to get there, how we can engage, for example, with different authorities to uh, be able to get the funds to be there at the same time. So it was completely useful, really, really useful, not only on practical, but also theoretical terms. Now that we've painted a picture of the current research initiatives that constitute security in context, it's imperative that we talk about what comes next. I asked our guests about their perspective on the future of the project and how they see it evolving. Here's what they said. So we'll continue our, our collaboration that we have done in the past few years um, by moving into uh, questions that have been identified on the, from the first stage. For example, from multipolarity, the reconfiguration of the global hierarchies of power, as well as the cost-benefit analysis of the new global powers within the emerging South uh, needs to be explored and examined further. Uh, the same uh, is true for the various costs and benefits of global South interactions and exchanges, be that at the development level, be that at the political level, be that at security alliances, be that institution building, be that human rights, be that labor movements, be that climate change, uh, be that institution building, democracy, and so on. I think that those are areas that we need to move forward um, and perhaps come up with ways of having a a um, scorecard type um, analysis of under what conditions south-side exchanges or north-side exchanges could be beneficial for both parties or mutually uh, versus when it may fail and what are the um, the implications of the south-south solidarity when it means state versus non-state actors um, and what are the costs and benefits to various communities and also what are the insecurities or changes in the insecurity definitions and perceptions out of those exchanges. So I think that's, that those, there, there's plenty of uh, new research to, to go into that. Uh, the financialization of our economies are also uh, with increasing securitization of the global diplomatic landscape, um, and the invasion of Ukraine was not the only one, but one of those uh, events. If you look at the military-industrial complex, be that financialization of war making, be that um, the multifaceted nature of nature of global financial flows and investments into into and out of defense industries, including both state and non-state actors across borders. I think will be interesting to continue exploring those. The grassroots and women's grassroots based peace building and what examples we can learn from CPD's experience in northern Uganda and especially the peace building efforts of women's grassroots organization in northern Uganda. I think are uh, offering significant um, lessons for other conflict zones uh, around the world, including the Middle East. For example, what the Northern Ugandan experience and women's experiences with it can offer to to Syrian uh, problem going forward, or to the Lebanese, or to the Kurdish, and um, and others around the world. So I think we'll look for partnerships in terms of helping develop those connections among various actors and partners we have and hubs in, in, the, in the global south, especially in conflict and post-conflict regions. Um, so I see it more like a facilitator rather than organizer in terms of building those networks and, and bringing hubs and groups uh, that have common goals, not necessarily the same angle of analysis or, or uh, the same gaze or unit of analysis, but I think uh, they can learn a lot from each other. It's really been great to see as some of the existing research has been disseminated on the website um, that I have more um, young scholars and current PhD students who are reaching out because they too are interested in this topic, which actually isn't really, doesn't really exist as a concrete sort of research agenda. <laughs> um, I know because I, I looked for it. <laughs> Um, and in, you know, in, in terms of critical theory, it definitely exists as an area of inquiry, but not a lot of people are trying to contribute long periods of time to developing the sort of uh, empirical uh, foundation that would allow us to really characterize what the relationship between financialization and militarization actually looks like. Um, so there's definitely more interest, so we're going to bring on a couple new scholars um, into the research track, um, especially scholars who are looking at um, this manifestation 
on a sort of a country level basis um, because it'll, there are quite a few countries who are sort of um, marshalling their financial reserves right to uh, to support and expand these types of uh, weapons and military technology industries so actually getting some individual case studies of how that takes place and what that looks like, I think will be very important in helping us conceptualize it um, a little bit a little bit better. Um, and I think we'd really like to get it into the NGO and policy and think tank world um, because there are so many uh, really committed <laughs> scholars and activists that look at the global arms industry and the military industrial complex and pose questions about, you know, how do we dismantle the military industrial complex? What are the steps that we need to take? The other, the other thing the f in terms of the future is that we'd like to have, we'd like to think about engaging audiences uh, and we have a number of different audiences that we could think about, but we would have to decide on one to do like a public education event or maybe a series of ones. Um, the location would be important, the audience would be important, and again, uh, we could think at, you know, in terms of specifically disseminating to policymakers, but there's also this idea of a broader policy community, uh, both in North America and outside it, that would be fascinating to engage, you know, the, the, the communities and the lives that have been affected by the last several decades, war on terrorism, the various interventions. Um, so thinking about ways not to speak down to these communities, like to disseminate the research to them and go, here's what we found, but rather to engage them in a conversation that for many of them would be very personal and very difficult, but probably no one has ever you know, thought to ask them. Like we talk about the costs of uh, these wars. We can put numbers on them. We can put trend lines, we can see things that are destroyed and things like that. But, you know, that very personal level, I think, is, is what's missing. So, it's very, you know, I think that's challenging. It's not easy um, to get to those communities. Uh, but that would, but, but these are the kinds of ideas we're thinking about. I guess you think about the like, heterodox methods of dissemination as opposed to just producing an academic journal article um, or giving a talk to policymakers to try to think about a broader uh, community of, of, of people that are affected by foreign policy, but they may not, you know, think in those 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 strict terms. I think that we're hoping ultimately to have to bring people together who are there's a lot of people doing really fascinating work on carceralism in different countries and comparative. And I would love, you know, one product of this to ultimately be a conference that brings some of the best, you know, minds working on this topic together and put together maybe an edited volume. Yeah, we have uh, now uh, a work in progress, uh, which is the research on the measurement of insecurity. So we're trying to see if we can uh, establish a, a, a measurement that reflects the first, the, our understanding, our critical understanding for security, to see the foundations of this, to see the dynamics and different actors and how they behave. So it's kind of a diagnosis of the security slash insecurity in the region, and it could it goes beyond because it's established as as a framework, and to conduct this as a pilot project uh, in some countries, we we didn't decide yet where we can start this, but I think we can choose two countries from two different regions within specific conditions and to start the, the process. This can be uh, used as, as a baseline for further research in the future, uh, further understanding, and also to open the dialogue with the different societies about how to counter the uh, insecurity or security that have been used by different political actors. So this is from research point of view. It's uh, hopefully we can finalize this by the end of this year not the, it's the framework and the tools. And then we can conduct the survey later on in different countries. Uh, on the other side, we have the dialogue that I mentioned. So the dialogue is uh, trying to see um, a critical discussion about the knowledge production, how this is relevant to the societies, how this can be 
uh, uh, highlight the gaps in research or uh, highlight the need for different information inputs to uh, to feed the dialogues uh, in the country apart from the hegemony of uh, mainstream uh, donors uh, political actors on the uh, in this public sphere it's trying to open a very small space but it's uh, free from uh, from different uh, authoritarian actors and also from money domination toward more independent uh, evidence-based dialogue. After I uh, spent some time uh, in person with my colleagues, I realized how many uh, connections we have right now with, the, with our research. So uh, I think the future is to be even more connected to uh, the professors and other scholars connected to the screening context. So definitely I think I would try to include even more countries right now how those uh, resistant movements are operating on this exploratory need. So uh, I'm right now dealing with a little bit of Israel, Egypt, uh, with the Palestinians, uh, and Brazil, and Ecuador, and I definitely want to include more countries connected to my colleagues in the security context. So maybe in the next years we'll be uh, realizing the end of the day there's not a, such a localized threat. I mean, there's such a gigantic discussion happening right now, and I'm quite sure the platform will be essential to uh, being able to engage with different scholars all across the globe. So the conference at the University of Oklahoma that you mentioned really was a chance for us to look back at what's been accomplished, but also to look forward for the next two to three years. And we have a significant number of um, ways in which the project is going to be increasing its sort of research outputs, but also bringing online the other components of the project, which are the pedagogy and public policy components. The research tracks are going to be organized under four main branches. Uh, the first branch uh, is going to be uh, multipolarity and understanding global dynamics through the lens of multipolarity, looking at the increasing great power competition uh, between countries like the U.S., Russia, China, and Europe, uh, European Union, but also looking at its impact on other countries of the global south from a particular perspective. Uh, the second research track is going to be uh, global capitalism and transnational war economies, which is really looking at the intersection of big finance, uh, 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 basically capitalist industrial production with increasing sort of investments in uh, militarism and security. The third research component is going to be measuring insecurity and redefining insecurity. And that's really uh, one of the core aspects of the project is how do we actually understand and redefine the concept of security? And uh, there's a, a really key partnership here that we are conducting with the Syrian Center for Policy Research to create new methodologies, conceptual methodologies for understanding security and insecurity, and then using those to develop um, uh, new methodological approaches for surveys that uh, are going to be based on semi-structured interviews with populations in different countries who have experienced conflict or who have, uh, you know, sometimes experienced war, uh, but really trying to surface through engaging in, in dialogue with, with directly with community members of how they understand uh, security and insecurity and also how they propose alternatives. And finally, the fourth research uh, track is going to be uh, what we're calling class, race, gender, and insecurity, the really intersectional approach about how endless investments in militarism and securitization uh, have a destructive impact on working class people, on women, on racialized populations. So we're really merging a lot of our research working groups and components under these four main headings to increase the sort of intentionality and increase the focus of our research. We're going to be um, bringing on a significant number of new writers who are engaging with the project from the Middle East, from North Africa, from Latin America, who are going to be publishing uh, under those, those headings. Uh, and the second real main focus is going to be increasing our pedagogical outputs, using uh, the research that we've produced so far for the last two years, and we're going to continue producing, uh, to develop uh, small teams that curate uh, key resources to be used by instructors, to be used by activists and journalists, and other people who want to really search for alternative knowledge production than, than the dominant knowledge production on this topic. 
Um, there's lots of other exciting things. I'm really sure that this podcast is going to continue to be an amazing uh, outlet and platform for debate, for discussion. Uh, and I see that um, a lot of our audiovisual outputs, including the, the short videos that we're going to be producing, will also help uh, disseminate and make our research outputs much more accessible to a wider group of people. So lots of exciting things. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, we're actually, I'll just say that we're revamping our website uh, completely, and it's going to come on shortly uh, in the new year. Uh, really incredible um, new platform uh, that is going to be actually much easier to navigate and also a resource for anyone who wants to get material from our website. They're going to be able to um, use our website as, as a platform to sort of search uh, regardless of what their interest is, uh, what their topic is in, in sort of the broad parameters of the project, uh, it's going to be much more accessible to them. So stay tuned for all of those changes. You were just listening to Omar Dahi, Shana Marshall, Pete Moore, Lisa Hajar, Fred Demir, Rabia Nasser, and Fernando Brancoli. Thank you for listening to the Security in Context podcast. Follow us on Twitter or check out our website to stay up to date with our events, publications, videos, and more.